At the beginning of this month, a new Canadian law went into effect which banned foreigners from buying residential properties in the country as an investment for two years. The law was passed as a reaction to the spike in home prices caused by the pandemic, on top of a real estate market that was already unaffordable for a lot of Canadians, especially those living in large cities like Vancouver or Toronto. It is hoped that this policy will cut demand from the market so that regular citizens that are just looking for a place to live won't have to compete with investors from abroad that want to profit from homes by turning them into rentals, Airbnbs, or just using them as land banks. Unaffordable property is by no means a problem unique to Canada either. A lot of economies around the world have struggled with unaffordable real estate markets, making it quite difficult for regular people to live and work in the cities that they were born in. The long-term impacts of unaffordable housing can be huge for economies if it's not managed well, because it can slow down the rate at which people start families, it can cause less participation in the workforce, and it will force people out of productive centres of industry. Because of these problems, there are likely to be a lot of other economies watching to see if Canada's foreign investment ban plays out well over the next two years, or if it was just political pandering. There are already a lot of other economists saying that this is too little too late and the plan is unlikely to do much for the housing market, which is already falling due to the rise in interest rates, concerns about extended recessions and people changing the way that they use their homes. But because this is such an important issue that impacts us all so directly, it's worthwhile having a good understanding of a few key economic questions. So first and foremost, will Canada's ban on foreign investors actually reduce home prices in the country? What are some of the negative side effects that this market intervention could cause? And finally, what happens when this ban ends in two years' time, like it's currently supposed to? This episode of Economics Explained is brought to you by Established Titles. Established Titles is a fun and silly little way to make yourself or a loved one sound much more important than they really are by buying a tiny souvenir plot of land and taking advantage of an old Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies in English. Now, while that title might not come with a castle and a suit of armour, it can technically be used for things like credit cards and airline tickets, and nothing says nobility like being lord of economy class seat 38F. Most importantly, established titles works directly with One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. So if you're thinking of a fun gift for Valentine's Day that gives something back, why not make your special someone a lord or a lady? The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking distance. So, depending on how many of you want to become a lord or lady, we can build our own little economics explained kingdom. The housing market gets a lot of attention from economists for a few very good reasons. A house is usually the largest purchase an economic participant will make in their life, and it's also a purchase that is normally made with debt. Real estate is also a large source of government revenue through land taxes, sales duties, or some combination of both. So, a house purchase has broader impacts on the economy for a long time after the transaction is done. In the same way, foreign investment is also something that gets a lot of attention from economists because it is one of the primary ways that money can flow into and out of an economy. So, it makes sense that the foreign investment into housing probably gets more attention than it really should for how much of an impact it truly has on an economy. But for now, let's look at these issues one by one. House prices in most advanced economies have become something that needs to be carefully controlled because it simultaneously represents people's investments, their biggest expense, and the place where they live. If house prices get too high relative to people's incomes, it can have a number of undesirable impacts on the economy. For example, if people are paying more in rent or mortgage repayments just to live in their house, they'll have less money left over to spend on everything else. And local businesses like restaurants, gyms and entertainment venues are usually the first things to get cut out of household budgets to cover these costs. Higher house prices also directly impact the businesses themselves because commercial real estate and residential real estate are effectively the same markets. If one is getting more expensive, the other one will be too. This means that businesses end up paying more of their income to rent and are either forced to raise their prices to compensate or save money in other areas like cutting down on salaries. Cutting down on salaries further reduces the amount of money that consumers have to spend in the economy and also means that those workers may simply not be able to afford to live in the area where they are needed. This problem was only accelerated by the pandemic, which saw real estate prices in places like Canada explode in value. Businesses were suffering from increased real estate prices while also struggling to attract customers due to lockdowns and travel restrictions. A lot were kept alive by government programs, a lot went out of business, and some just scraped by by increasing prices and cutting down on every expense they could, normally starting with workers. Now, house prices should eventually be limited by how much people earn in that area. Even if the average worker saved absolutely nothing and spent every last dollar they made on rent or mortgage repayments, they couldn't spend more than they made, so eventually home prices would need to reach a cap. 
This used to be true, but the rise of platforms like Airbnb and the migration of high paying remote workers moving to cheaper areas has meant that real estate in certain regions, especially large touristy cities, is no longer bound by how much their residents can earn, but by how much people from abroad are willing to spend there. On a microeconomic level, this can cause social issues because it displaces normal residents and replaces them with tourists, so the only businesses that can survive are businesses that cater to those tourists. That means the few people that weren't already priced out of these areas will be forced to move out because regular essential businesses like supermarkets just won't operate there. High house prices can also make the economy very difficult to control. In most economies, the mortgage interest rates that people pay change as the central bank changes their target rates. If a central bank needs to increase interest rates to fight off inflation in an economy where a lot of people have taken out very large loans to buy themselves a place to live, then they risk putting the economy into recession because people's repayments will increase significantly. If people are forced to sell their homes or end up defaulting on their mortgages, it will create a very unstable market that could accelerate the inflation that the bank was trying to fight in the first place. This can cause stagflation, which is high unemployment, low growth and high inflation a very dangerous place for any economy to be in. If house prices are a more reasonable share of people's income, then it allows the central bank to make more decisive movements without running the risk of putting the economy's most influential market into a tailspin. All of these economic problems also ignore the main issue, that people need a roof over their head. Shelter is one of the most fundamental human needs and economies exist to improve the living standards of their participants. It's hard to argue that even a very rich economy is successful if its people can't provide that fundamental need for themselves. So maintaining house prices at a reasonable level is very important for the productive functioning of an economy. But there is also a very strong argument that governments should not interfere with the markets. Last year, I was fortunate enough to be invited to be a speaker at an economic forum held by the then finance minister here in Australia a country with a very similar housing market to Canada's in that it's expensive relative to already very high incomes and foreign investors get a lot of the blame for that unaffordable housing. Since this was before an election, the topic of house prices naturally came up and the question was asked to the audience by show of hands, who is in favour of affordable housing? As you might expect, most people raised their hands. A few minutes went by and a few more questions were answered by the speakers and then back to the audience, they were asked by a show of hands who would support economic policies that reduced their home prices. Nobody raised their hands. Unfortunately, the irony was lost on a lot of the audience. And yes, of course, the kind of people that attend a government forum on economic policy are generally speaking going to be older, wealthier homeowners. But they did still like the idea of housing being affordable, as long as it wasn't their housing that was affordable. That's not completely unfair either. People have been told for a very long time that buying a house is good financial management and is an important step towards other financial goals like retirement. If house prices were artificially pushed down by government policies, it would leave a lot of people with mortgages that are worth more than the homes they are in. You might think that's just the risk that you need to take when buying a home, but if people can only just afford to pay these mortgages, then they may find themselves locked into one house for two or three decades, unable to move for better opportunities because if they move out of their house, they'll be forced to pay the difference between their outstanding loan and their sale price. If people buy houses as an investment, then they should accept the risks associated with all investments, that you are never guaranteed to make money and in some cases you can lose money. But people would obviously prefer if that didn't happen, especially if they've taken on a lot of debt. Most people are also just buying a house as a place to live and probably don't really care what the market price of their home is on any given day, as long as it's less than their outstanding mortgage or any other home that they might want to upsize or downsize into in the future. The reason this is important is because Canada is a democracy. The government needs to make policy in line with the will of the people and Canada has a 66% home ownership rate. So the majority of people don't want real estate to get cheaper. Even still, one of the biggest arguments against banning foreign investment into real estate put forth by critics of the Canadian government's recent policy decision is that it won't do much to fix housing. The law that they just put in place specifically bans foreigners from investing into residential real estate in Canada, but they are allowed to buy a home if they plan to live there, or if they're a permanent resident, or on a working visa, or on a student visa. Foreign nationals with temporary resident status, refugees, diplomats, councillor staff and members of international organisations living in Canada can also buy properties. The law also only applies to residential housing. So if a foreigner wanted to buy an apartment block with four or more units in it, they would be allowed to. They are also allowed to purchase recreational properties like cottages, cabins, vacation homes and service resort apartments. Basically all of the most popular categories on Airbnb. 
This has a lot of economists pointing out that this law might appeal to popular sentiment of keeping rich people from other countries out of the homes that could go to Canadians, but it probably won't reduce demand for housing very much at all. The data surrounding the Canadian housing market is mostly collected at a provincial level, so there are some regions that just don't track the relevant information at all. The provinces that do show the proportion of residential properties where one or more owners was a non-resident was less than 6%, with the only exception being the city of Vancouver, where the rate was 6.2%. A reasonable assumption is that a lot of those foreign buyers also had a Canadian partner, so they would still have an outlet to purchase any Canadian home they wanted after this law was passed anyway. These numbers also track the current ownership, not new purchases, which has been trending downwards in recent years. In 2021, only 1.1% of British Columbian home sales involved a foreign buyer, which was down from 3% in 2017. This trend was caused by a combination of new taxes on foreign investments and a general tax on property speculators who were leaving homes empty. Realistically, these taxation measures probably fix the problem without the need for a total investment ban that has more holes in it than a Tim Hortons display case. They might have also caused more problems than they've fixed. Last week we made a video looking at the economy of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now obviously, and I cannot stress this enough, Canada is a very different economy to the DRC. One is one of the wealthiest nations in the world and the other is one of the poorest. But the DRC and Canada do share a similar economic problem. They lack the investment necessary to get the optimal output from their workers. The DRC is an extreme example where almost nobody is willing to invest into a country that is marred by corruption, conflict and economic mismanagement. But Canada still suffers from the same problem. The average Canadian worker produces $57 worth of value every hour, where the average worker in the USA produces $73 worth of value every hour, despite Canada having a slightly healthier and better educated workforce. The difference is that institutions in the USA invested $20,500 per worker on worker capital as of 2019, where Canadian institutions only spent $13,000 in the same time period. We have already covered this specific issue extensively in our video on the economy of Canada, so I don't want to repeat too much here, but the reason why Canada doesn't invest more into its workers is because it can't. The USA is the investment capital of the world for a lot of reasons. It uses the world's reserve currency, it is home to fantastic global companies, it has a strong legal system to settle business disputes, but most of all, it is very friendly to foreign investors. Receiving trillions of dollars in investments from countries all over the world allows American businesses to give their workers the tools that they need to create companies that go on to be household names. Any international investor putting money into Canada would have to have a pretty good reason to pick it over the much bigger and more obvious market to their south. Passing laws like the ban on foreign investment into residential real estate might not directly stop investment flows into more productive markets like public and private companies, but it does send the message to international investors that Canada doesn't want their money, even though they could probably benefit from it. In fact, foreign investment could be one of the keys to fixing housing affordability if investors from abroad were welcome to use their money in the country, as long as it was spent on projects that built new housing. Instead of trying to cut down on less than 1% of the demand in a market that was already falling from its COVID peaks, a much more productive long-term strategy would simply be to build more houses. This may not be as politically popular as a policy that shifts the blame onto a non-factor, but if Canada and other advanced economies want to continue their policy of inviting skilled workers into their country to fill out for their ageing populations, then the indisputable truth is that they are going to need somewhere to put them all. And the solution to that problem is not getting people to demand less, it's putting systems in place to supply more. Don't forget, you can also listen to all of our videos on Spotify as video podcasts. This means that you can watch EE videos on the Spotify app and seamlessly switch to audio only for on-the-go listening. Link is in the video description below. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.